This is Mountaintop History, a podcast produced by the Thomas Jefferson Foundation at Monticello. Mountaintop History brings forward meaningful stories from this historic home and plantation, from the past and from the present. My name is Kyle Chattleton. And I'm Olivia Brown. Thank you for joining us. We hope you'll learn something new. The Affair of the Chesapeake put war into my hand. I had only to open it and let havoc loose. Thomas Jefferson to James Maury, 1812. During the early years of the American Republic, the new nation was repeatedly tested and challenged by foreign powers. We recently covered the Citizen Genet Affair in our In the Course of Human Events podcast series. The affair proved to be a diplomatic headache for then-President George Washington. By pressuring the American government to pick a side during the wars between Britain and France. When John Adams was president, the United States and the French engaged in a quasi war at sea that eventually concluded in 1800. These tensions between American and foreign powers would continue during President Thomas Jefferson's administration. And one of the most pressing challenges involved you guessed it, Great Britain and France. From Jefferson's perspective, it nearly brought the United States to war. Let's begin with some context. From 1792 until 1802, France was not only undergoing revolution, but was also repeatedly at war with the British and other European nations, what historians today call the French Revolutionary Wars. While those wars ended in 1802 with the Treaty of Amiens, Europe was again engrossed in combat one year later with the beginning of the Napoleonic Wars. The British, in particular, faced significant challenges. This included desertion by soldiers and the continual need for new recruits in an ever-expanding fleet of warships. Throughout the French Revolutionary Wars and Napoleonic Wars, the British Royal Navy grew from 135 to 584 ships, which required nearly 80,000 new sailors. Voluntary recruitment, however, proved to be difficult. According to historian John P. Deben, quote, the Royal Navy had a venerable and notorious reputation for long voyages, harsh discipline, and poor compensation, end quote. Enlisted soldiers also deserted the Navy in significant numbers. The British solved these problems in part by impressing people. Impressing here does not mean that British officers showed off the might of the Navy to potential sailors. Impressment was the practice of forcing men into military service. Deben explains that, quote, As Britain evolved into a strong seafaring nation, the Royal Navy gradually viewed impressment as a legitimate method of recruitment, and by the 18th century, Britain came to regard impressment as a maritime right and extended the practice to boarding neutral merchant ships in local waters and at sea. While impressment was ostensibly an effort to bring British deserters back into the Navy, American citizens were themselves forced into foreign military service on the high seas. John Quincy Adams, the son of second president John Adams, frequently traveled across the Atlantic Ocean, and as a result, became familiar with the realities of impressment. In 1828, he shared his recollections and thoughts on the practice. Quote, this authorized system of kidnapping upon the ocean was practiced under the odious pretense of a right in the King of Great Britain 
to force his own subjects into his naval service in time of war. To the execution of this law, no judge, no jury, no writ of habeas corpus affords to the British seaman the protection of liberty or of life. Its execution is on the desert of the ocean. Its executors, armed men. The pretense was the right of the king to take his own subjects only. The practice was to presume every man a British subject who was wanted. Whenever an American merchant ship met a British armed vessel at sea, she was visited by a midshipman or lieutenant from the man of war, at whose command her whole crew was summoned upon her deck, and there every man of them passed in review before this often beardless boy, who compared their persons with their protections and finished by taking or leaving the man, just as his temper or fancy decided his choice. Impressment occurred throughout George Washington's and John Adams's presidencies, but was mostly left unchecked, as the United States was in a weak position compared to the mightier British Empire. Thomas Jefferson observed it all, as Washington's Secretary of State and Adams's Vice President. And when Jefferson became the third president of the United States, British impressment was still an issue that needed resolving. It was, quote, humiliating for Americans, according to Jefferson scholar Dumas Malone, and only became more prevalent during the third president's tenure. As a result, President Jefferson had two American diplomats, James Monroe and William Pinckney, meet with British officials and attempt to negotiate a treaty on impressment and other trade disputes. The negotiations took place between August and December 1806, but throughout the talks, the British refused to address impressment in the treaty. The American ambassadors nevertheless were privately assured by the British that the Royal Navy would take, quote, greatest caution in the impressing of British seamen, and that the strictest care shall be taken to preserve the citizens of the United States from any molestation or injury. In other words, they promised to make sure they were only impressing British subjects and not American citizens. Without any language about impressment, a treaty was slowly drawn up by Monroe, Pinckney, and their British counterparts. President Jefferson was dismayed about the news and updates he was receiving back home. Dumas Malone writes, quote, According to the president, who was more disturbed by Monroe and Pinckney's communication the more he considered it, they greatly misjudged the temper of the American people who, in his opinion, would rather go without a treaty than with one that did not settle the question of impressment, end quote. So when the treaty got to Jefferson, he refused to submit it to the Senate for approval. Tensions would not be alleviated anytime soon. In fact, things only got worse. During the month of February 1807, there were reports that three men aboard the British HMS Melampus had deserted and fled to the USS Chesapeake. Members of the British government demanded that the three men be returned to the Royal Navy, but the request was rejected. Instead, Secretary of State James Madison commissioned an investigation, which ultimately found that the three people in question, John Strahan, William Ware, and Daniel Martin, were not British deserters, but were actually American citizens 
who had been earlier impressed into the Royal Navy. The British did not relent. Vice Admiral George Cranfield ordered that if any British ships should encounter the USS Chesapeake on the sea, they should board the ship and search for any deserters. On June 22, 1807, the HMS Leopard came across the Chesapeake. A British messenger boarded the vessel and demanded to search for deserters. The Chesapeake's captain, James Barron, refused this directive. The Leopard responded by firing a series of broadsides into the American ship. Historian John Meacham writes, quote, 22 shots struck the Chesapeake before the Americans managed to get off a single rejoinder, end quote. Captain Barron eventually surrendered his vessel. Three crew members were dead, 18 were wounded, and four were captured, including John Strahan, William Ware, and Daniel Martin. The Chesapeake Leopard Affair caused a firestorm in America. Jefferson later wrote, Never since the Battle of Lexington have I seen this country in such a state of exasperation as at present. And even that did not produce such unanimity. Calls for war grew across the American countryside. William Duane wrote to Jefferson during the following July that the British could be fought on four different battlefields, Canada, Halifax, Newfoundland, and Jamaica. Jefferson issued a proclamation, quote, A frigate of the United States, trusting to a state of peace and leaving her harbor on a distant service, has been surprised and attacked by a British vessel of superior force and has been disabled from service with the loss of a number of men killed and wounded. This enormity was not only without provocation or justifiable cause, but was committed with the avowed purpose of taking by force from a ship of war of the United States a part of her crew." End quote. But rather than send the nation into war, Jefferson addressed the situation with two significant actions. First, he demanded that all armed British vessels leave American harbors and waters. Second, he supported congressional efforts for an embargo. The Embargo Act of 1807, as it is now known, prevented American ships from exporting goods from American harbors, and also forbid the importation of British goods. The rationale was to prevent American vessels from being commandeered on the high seas, and to punish the British specifically for their actions. Over the next few months and years, there were a number of significant developments. First, the British ultimately acknowledged that the attack on the Chesapeake was a mistake and returned the three captured American citizens. The embargo had a minimal impact on Great Britain and the rest of Europe, but led to a costly and negative economic crisis in the United States. The embargo, as a result, was repealed and replaced with the Non-Intercourse Act of 1809, which barred British and French ships from American shores. The passage of this new act signaled that tensions were still present between the United States and European powers. British impressment, for example, was still an issue for America that needed to be resolved. Jefferson later wrote that the affair of the Chesapeake put war into my hand. I had only to open it and let havoc loose. 
but combat would come regardless for the new nation. Jefferson's successor, President James Madison, would govern his country during the War of 1812. This has been another episode of Mountaintop History, a collaboration podcast between WTJU and the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. Join us for new episodes every two weeks on Apple and Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and the Virginia Audio Collective. To learn more about Monticello or to plan your next trip, visit us online at monticello.org. <laughs>